All right. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Today, we're very excited to have David from Charles University. He's going to tell us about remarkable symmetries of rotating black holes. Please take it away. Well, thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting to give this talk here. And so here is the, the plan of the talk. So I will try to first explain what I mean by this remarkable or hidden or dynamical symmetries. Then I will review that you know these symmetries um, exist uh, in the care geometry, in the care space-time as we know it. Um, and then I will tell you what is the, the principal hero behind all these symmetries, which I will call principal killing Yano tensor. And I will tell you about its properties and how you know, what kind of implications the existence of this tensor uh, really has. Um, in particular, I will you know, get you familiar with what, what, what I mean by killing Yano family. Uh, I will tell you some uniqueness theorem. Uh, and I will tell you that, you know, the existence of the principal killing Yano tensor implies immediately uh, complete integrability of geodesic motion, separability of many uh, field equations, in, uh, you know, uh, in, in the given space time and so on. And if time permits, I will also talk about a, a slightly different structure um, of, you know, very interesting structure of killing tensor towers in, in generalized lens at Turing space times, if time permits. But we shall see. Anyway, so my talk is based on this, uh, well, six year old now um, living review and relativity um, over here. But I will mention some some more recent results as well uh, as we as we proceed. So. What are hidden symmetries or what are dynamical symmetries? And let me give you a very simple example of a dynamical symmetry. So consider just the Newtonian physics um, and consider central force problem. So, um, you know, the, the, everything is static. So you have conserved energy um, and also it's uh, spherically symmetric. So then you have conserved angular momentum. So that's true for any central force. However, if you specify to a particular case of, of central force, which is the Kepler force, which goes like some constant over R square, uh, then suddenly a new integral of motion for your motion appears, which is this famous Laplace Runge lens vector. It's a vector A, and you can see the geometrical meaning of this vector. It's simply P cross L uh, added to a vector which is proportional to the uh, to uh, uh, the radial direction, and m is the mass of the particle which is orbiting over here. So you can imagine that you have a particle, or you, you have Earth orbiting around Sun, and this vector a will always point at every point of your trajectory. It will point in the same way. It will be conserved. It will be. Uh, it will provide another three integrals of motion for your motion. Okay. Um, so the existence of this A um, makes the, the Kepler motion uh, uh, maximally superintegrable. So we are in three dimensions. That means your phase space is six dimensional. Uh, so now you have always one trivial integral of motion, which is basically like the choice of the initial time. So, so you are left with five possibly non-trivial integrals of motions if they exist. And this is precisely provided by E l and a which makes it seven in total but they are not all independent you have two constraints you have a times l is equal to zero that's one constraint and a square is given by in terms of the other quantities as, as such here so you in fact you have five integrals motion uh, for Kepler problem which makes the motion completely integrable so now this this the existence of this laplace, uh, laplace Runge lens vector it provides uh i would say a canonical example of what i mean by a hidden symmetry. So let me explain what is this hidden symmetry. Um, and for that, let me just very briefly review the basics of Hamiltonian dynamics. So of course you start with a symplectic two-form, which is a non-degenerate closed two-form omega. And that allows to any function which you have in your phase space to, to do the symplectic gradient. So basically to any function, I can assign the corresponding vector field, which is given, uh, given over here. So now, of course, I can use uh, the Darbu theorem, and because my my symplectic two form is non-degenerate and closed, I can always choose coordinates uh, xi to be x and p, so that my omega takes this canonical form. And in which case, you know, if you specify to this 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 type of coordinates, you will have the canonical Poisson brackets and, and so on and so on. So now, what is interesting for us is that 
we have not a theorem. So namely, if your Hamiltonian is preserved by an infinitesimal transformation of delta x and delta p, uh, which means that if this vector field xq leaves your Hamiltonian invariant, then you will have the corresponding concept quantity q, which is precisely uh, the function which generates this uh, vector field xq according to this uh, symplectic gradient. So, so that's the Noether's theorem. So if you have symmetry of h, then uh, there is a corresponding uh, concept quantity. Um, so by the way, if you have any questions, please stop me and, and, and interrupt me anytime, OK? Um, very good. So this is at the level of the phase space. Uh, and for general phase space, right? But typically, our phase space is not completely general. It is written as a cotangent bundle over some manifold M. And you can really distinguish in that, uh, you know, in that phase space what you mean by configuration space, and and you know how you build a structure above this above this configuration space. So, so in particular, for example, in general relativity, you know that the configuration space is equipped uh, with the curve metric. And so that's precisely, you know, that, that distinguishes the configuration space and then makes the configuration spe phase special there, right? So you don't have any phase space metric, capital G mu nu, which would depend on X and P, unless you go beyond general relativity. Um, so, so really, you know, you have distinguished configuration space and your phase space is a cotangent bundle. So in that case, uh, of course, you have the standard canonical projection, which projects your uh, cotangent bundle over M to the manifold M itself. That's your canonical projection. And of course, I can pu pull back this projection and apply it to any vector fields or tensor fields which live on my cotangent space. So in particular, I can apply it to this symmetry uh, field, um, which generates my conserved charge. So, so, so this is my pullback of, of, of that uh, canonical projection. And if I apply it here, I end up with, with uh, something. And that something either is uh, a vector field on the manifold M, or it is not a well-defined vector field on the manifold M. Uh, so in the first case, um, I will call the corresponding charge or the corresponding symmetry and isometry. In the other case, when this does not define um, a well-defined vector field on M, I will call it a dynamical symmetry. So now let's see what happens with this Laplace Runge lens vector. So if you calculate, so of course you have three three conserved quantities, I can combine all of them together, and there's these three corresponding vector fields, xA, um, and this is how they look like. So they have the d over dx direction, and they have the d over dp direction. So now what this uh, pullback of the canonical projection is doing, it is actually uh, killing the d over dp part. And so what you are left with after the projection is just the first part over here. So now if I look at what stands in front of d over dx, um, it, it, it's p dependent. Okay, so, so this is not a standard vector field which would be defined uh, on my manifold m because it depends on p and of course uh, p is not well defined on that manifold. So that means that uh, our laplace runge lenz vector is a dynamical symmetry rather than an isometry. Um, OK. So very good. So now let's extend this to, to general relativity. And let's just start with the simplest possible example, which is like, let's consider particle motion. So here's the corresponding uh, Hamiltonian is just p square over, um, over 2. And of course, uh, that leads to the geodesic equation as written over here. So now what you can do is, as, as, as you do in your introductory courses on uh, basic relativity, is that you say, OK, so why don't I consider constants of motion, which would be linear in the momentum? So I take some vector field k, uh, contract it with my momentum p, uh, and require that this is a constant of motion for any geodesic. So then you will find out that this vector field k has to satisfy a killing vector equation. So how, how this is a very simple calculation, so let's do it. I require that this is zero for any, any geodesic. Of course, I have two terms. Well, okay, so, so this, uh, that's what dot means. I transport along the geodesic, this quantity over here, and I differentiate either the first term or I differentiate the second term. If I differentiate the second term, I'll find that this is just my geodesic equation and it has to be zero. If I differentiate the first term, then I have symmetric product of p nu p mu. So I have to I can symmetrize freely here 
And I find that if this is to be true for any geodesic, nabla nu k mu symmetrized has to be equal to zero. So that's how you derive the killing vector equation in the simple way. Um, very good. So now you may ask, OK, so very good. I have this concept quantity here. Um, so then what is the corresponding Hamiltonian vector field which uh, which corresponds to this concept quantity? And if you, if you do the calculation, you'll find that it has uh, this form over here. So again, it has the d over dp direction and d over dx direction. If I canonically project down to the manifold, then of course this piece disappear, and I just find that the canonical projection is just this k mu d over dx mu. So this is a very well-defined vector field on the manifold m, and that's why this really describes an isometry. Okay. However, now I can do something else. I can go to high orders uh, in the momentum p. So instead of considering integrals of motion which are linear in the momentum p, I can consider integrals of motion which are, let's say, uh, quadratic or cubic or whatever up to p uh, multiplications of the of the momentum p. And if you require that this thing here again is conserved um, along any geodesic, you will find a generalization of the killing vector equation, uh, which is here. You just take a covariant derivative, symmetrize over all possible indices, um, and this is called a kill killing tensor equation. Yeah. And interestingly, this uh, killing tensor equation was known already by Steckel in 1895. So sometimes people call the corresponding tensor Steckel killing tensors. But uh, basically, into physics was introduced by Walker and Penrose in 1970. So again, playing the same game. Now I can calculate what the corresponding uh, vector field which generates this CK is. And I can project it down to the manifold. And you will find that the result is like that. Again, the result here, whatever stands in front of d over, d, d, d over dx nu, depends on my momenta. And so. Uh, it's not a well-defined uh, vector field, and so killing tensors will correspond to dynamical symmetries. Um, okay, there's one more thing which I can do. Uh, uh, again, the simplest derivation. What if I require that I don't want just a constant which is uh, transported along geodesic, but I want the whole vector field. Let's call it W mu. That will be parallel transported along geodesic. Okay, and I, and maybe I can write it in in such a way that um, I will take some tensor f mu nu uh, dotted with p, and I require that it's not only parallel transported, but it's also perpendicular uh, to my original momentum p. Okay, if it, if it is perpendicular, that means that if I dot this with p, it has to be zero. So f mu nu has to be antisymmetric. Moreover, if I require this. Again, it's a one-line calculation to show that this equation will be satisfied, provided that f mu nu satisfies this generalization of the killing, killing vector equation. Um, in, well, this is, again, you take a covariant derivative. Now you symmetrize over two indices, uh, and that has to be equal to zero. Of course, you cannot symmetrize over more than two because uh, this is antisymmetric, and it would give you automatically zero. Right, so so basically, you have like two possible simple generalizations of killing vector equation to higher rank tensors. Either you take completely symmetric tensors, and you, you can, and then you uh, have this equation here. Corresponding tensors are called killing tensors, or you you have antisymmetric tensors, and then the generalization of the killing vector equation is over here. Um, and again, this was first considered in mathematics by Yano in 1952, um, but then brought to physics by Penrose a little bit later. Um, all right, so what I will mean by hidden symmetries for our purposes um, is that um, basically anything connected with killing tensors or with these killing Yano tensors, I will call hidden symmetries. Anything which, which is uh, standardly connected with killing vectors, I will call isometries. Uh, let me also remark this, that if you have a killing Yano tensor, this antisymmetric object here, it is a little bit more fundamental in the sense that if I have it, I can square it, and that will automatically give me a killing tensor. But of course, not every killing tensor can be written as F square, right? So there has to be some algebraic properties. You have to have eigenvalues, which are double degenerate and stuff like that. So, so if you have F mu, it's a little bit more fundamental. Killing Yano tensors are more fundamental than killing tensors. Okay, and although I have derived all these things basically 
by just talking about particles, uh, these symmetries have much more far-reaching consequences uh, than just a for geodesic motion. So they will they will be very important for any dynamical fields uh, in care of space time. Okay, uh, are there any questions at this point? Everything is super simple. Okay, very good. So now let me briefly review what happens for the care geometry. Um, so of course, care geometry is a vac unique vacuum solution of Einstein equations describing a rotating black hole in four D. Um, and discovered by Kerr, 1963. And, and interestingly, this was actually four years before uh, the term black hole was even coined by Wheeler. So, so the solution is older than that. Um, and you know, if the cosmic censorship is true, uh, then this is a final co uh, configuration of gravitational collapse and it should be generic uh, in our universe. So here is the geometry. And what is important for us is that it's just described by two parameters, the mass and the rotation parameter A. Okay. Um, so now this scale geometry is remarkable in many respects because it has not only these explicit symmetries, which we, which we know, but it has also these hidden symmetries, uh, which I just mentioned. Namely, uh, already in 1968, Carter showed that the geodesic motion in care is integrable. Uh, and this is only possible because there is an additional in integral of motion. So if you look at the metric, the metric does not depend on time and not, does not depend on phi. So there's two obvious killing vectors, dt and d phi. Uh, if you consider geodesics, time like geodesics, you have normalization of the four velocity. That's another integral of motion. Uh, so corresponding to dt, you have conserved energy. Corresponding to d phi, you have conserved angular momentum. However, that's not enough. You have only three integrals of motion, and so the geodesics should not be integrable. However, there exists this extra Carter's constant, which Carter discovered by separating the hamilton jacobi equation, which precisely is you know, uh, written as a killing tensor uh, times UA, UB, um, and that's the, that's the form of, the, of that constant. Okay, so that was basically the beginning of the study of hidden symmetries. Um, all right, so so this was for geodesics, but but more generally, um, you know, the hidden symmetries are important for other fields. So, namely, if you want to study, let's say, scalar field in the background of care geometry or Dirac field or electromagnetic perturbations or gravitational perturbations and so on, then actually these typically decouple and separate, or some parts of them decouple, some some special pieces of the field equations decouple. Um, and this is very useful because, uh, you know, that allows you to study many properties of these black holes. It allows you to, to uh, study the black hole shadow, it allows you to study Hawking evaporation and so on and so on, uh, black hole stability. Um, so you know these hidden symmetries are important for separability of, of various field equations, for decoupling and so on. Where they also play a role is basically how the care metric can be nicely written, and it can be written in this very special care shield form. Um, and so what is what is special about this form is that the full solution of nonlinear uh, Einstein equations can be written as a flat metric G0 here plus a linear in mass perturbation. Okay, so what, what L is here is a null vector and basically the only appearance of, of the mass is, is over here. Okay, so really it's a linear in mass perturbation of the flat space. Um, and in that sense, uh, you know, when you take this ansatz, your Einstein equations will linearize and it's something very, very, very special. Right, so now this, this form here is intimately related to the existence of this killing tensor and killing yellow tensor. Um, also, the care metric, and that's how it was originally found, is of special algebraic type. It is of uh, algebraic type D, where the wild tensor you know, is very special. Um, again, this is related to hidden symmetries. Namely, there is one fundamental symmetry, which basically, uh, distinguishes care among any other space times. And this is what is called the principal killing anotensor. tensor. So what, what that object is, it's a non-degenerate, uh, I will tell you what that means, closed conformal killing anotensor two form. So it's a, it's a two form, HAB, it's anti-symmetric object, which satisfies the following differential equation. So you take the covariant derivative of this H and it's given by a product of metric times some vector field. Okay. So now uh, what you will find is that if you contract this equation, you'll find that uh, 
this vector field psi is basically like a divergence of age. So, so this is already determined by by the um, by the age itself. Okay. So now, how are these these properties which I mentioned before related to the existence of this object? So, for example, the the Carter's constant, the killing tensor. Is, is like a square of this HAP. It is not the simple square as I showed you before for killing yellow tensors. There is a trace part, if you want, uh, which you have to add to this H square, but this is precisely your killing tensor. So if you have H, um, then you will have also a killing tensor. Uh, another property, for example, the, you know, the special algebraic type of the wild tensor, it simply follows from the integrability conditions of this equation. If you study the integrability conditions for this equation, you will immediately find that the space-time has to be algebraically special. It has to be type D. Okay. So now, of course, that this is true for care, and and you know that's that's uh, of physical importance. Um, however, as a mathematical a uh, question you may be asking, well, what happens in higher dimensions, right? And you, you, your motivations can, can can come either from string theory or, you know, from brain war scenario. So just just pure interest in like what happens in higher dimensional Einstein's gravity. Um, David, can and, I ask, in, just in, in four dimensions, yes. are there non-black hole solutions that have irreducible uh, killing tensors? Or... Oh, very good. Um, I will hopefully get to that. Yes, there are some space times which 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 can have uh, killing tensors, um, which which are interesting, but uh, of course the care I would say is the most interesting of them all. So typically, what what is true is that if you consider, uh, if you consider, for example, um, plane waves or whatever, they have extra symmetries, they have hidden symmetries, or if you consider Taubnat space times, they will have killing tensors and so on. So so yes, there are definitely other solutions. Uh, but I would say that the care is probably the most interesting one. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so I will now look at like the higher dimensional generalization of the care metric, and you will see how beautiful the structure, the geometric structure behind these solutions really is. So, so, so you know, uh, the, these generalizations of care are known as Myers Perry metrics, um, and they were constructed by Myers and Perry in 1986, um, and. They are a little bit more complicated than care, and the reason is that uh, in higher dimensions you can have more rotation parameters. Basically, your uh, space-time dimensions now split in. You, you can split them into two planes, um, and then the rot uh, and then you can have a rotation in each of the two planes, right? So, so that means that in fact you have many more uh, rotation parameters than than you have in in four dimensions. Interestingly, there is even a generalization of this metric um, and known as Kernot ADS space time. And that was constructed a little bit later by Chen, Lu, and Pope uh, 20 years later. Um, and you know that's basically like this Myers space space time, but you can add cosmological constant. And if you, if you believe in those, you can also add not parameters. So now what I will try to explain to you is like how, you know, the existence of these geometric objects is related to, you know, all these black hole space times uh, in, in arbitrary number of dimensions. Okay. So principle, killing the tensor. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit more. So uh, at first I told you, told you about killing Gano tensors, and then I told, told you about principal killing Gano tensor, and so, somehow it satisfied a, a different equation. So what's going on here? Um, so so here is the complete family of special objects. Um, so let's take a, a general differential p-form. So you have omega, which is a p-form, and let's take its covariant derivative. Okay, then you can show that that you can split it into three orthogonal pieces. You can sp split it into the piece which is given by the exterior derivative, antisymmetric derivative of omega. You can split it into piece which is given by the divergence of omega. And you can split it to the rest, which actually where the d of omega and divergence of omega is equal to zero. And that's standardly called harmonic part. So now mathematicians are mostly interested in harmonic forms, right? So, the, so for them, the exterior part and the divergence part are zero, and they just keep only this part over here. We will be doing exactly the opposite way. We will be crossing out the harmonic part, and we will have forms which have only exterior and divergence part. So here is what's happened. So you take a covariant derivative with respect to any field x of this omega, I don't know why I call it k now, and it's given by the exterior derivative of this k, 
uh, and this is just a standard scalar product between x and, 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 and k. Um, and the divergence of k, and then we have x understood as a one form, wedge uh, the divergence of k, OK? So, so this is the, a very special form, which misses this harmonic path here, OK? So then, because it's a special form, let's give it a name. Let's call it conformal Klingeno tensor. So now, if you want to cross out the conformal, and you just want to have a Killingano tensor, you will be crossing more terms out. In particular, we'll be crossing this term out. So if, if the divergence part is missing, and your covariant derivative of the form is simply given by the exterior derivative, you have a, a Killingano tensor. Of course, that means that you know the covariant derivative is completely antisymmetric. Uh, and if you symmetrize it over two indices, as, um, you get zero, as I was telling you before. On the other hand, you can have the other option. You can have closed conformal Killingano tensor, which means it's closed. So the exterior part is missing, and is uh, and the uh, uh, and the covariant derivative is simply given by this thing here. Okay, so these are the two special possibilities. So now, what is very interesting is that uh, these two possibilities behave nicely under Hodge duality. Namely, if you do a Hodge duality of a Killingano tensor, you get a closed conformal Killingano tensor and vice versa okay so so that that's very nice property of these objects by the way conformal killing and tensors uh it, it's really signs the conformal uh conformal property of these objects so if you consider conformally rescaled metric uh then um that conformal rescale metric will also have a conformal killing and tensor which you get some rescaling of this original can tensor k um i see a question i don't know if i can see the question Hi, hi, yeah. David. Um, it's Maria. Hi. Um, hi. One question. You mentioned tackle uh, as well. So is the conformal Klingiano sensor the same as, because some people in the literature call them tackle, conformal tackle. Is this the same Yano um, sensor or not? Because I think uh, in higher dimensions, yeah. This is a good question. I don't know. Um... So certainly, uh, I mentioned the stackle for the killing. Oh, that's very far away. Uh, the the name stackle here for the standard killing tensors, which are symmetric, and right. it's really because this guy considered you know these objects already in you know eighteen ninety five or whatever. Um, I have okay. never seen uh, putting the uh, the name stackle on these antisymmetric objects here. So so maybe you okay. know some people have done that. But but I would I would rather like put, put like Yano because he was the first guy who really you know came up with okay. these. So so yeah, I would I would reserve the stackle for the symmetric ones. Uh, does it answer your question? Yes. Okay. Yeah. There's this uh, paper by Cindy um, Killer and then right um, right. I think Finn and they mention that and they mix. Sometimes they call it okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Yes. So we can write to them. Then. Yeah. <laughs> <Very good. laughs> it was just to make sure that what th this tackle um, question. Okay. Yeah. You answered. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Uh, very good. So now let's take, you know, this very, very special object. Let's take just one object. Okay. Let's consider a two form and let's take it to be a closed conformal killing and a two form. So this part is missing. It's, it's closed. So, so D of that will be zero. So really, the covariant derivative is given by the divergence here, and it will be a two form. Okay. So so here's what happens. So let's consider a two form closed conformal killing and a two form. The covariant derivative is simply given by you know x times vector xi, and the xi is given by the divergence of this of this vector h. Okay. Um, it, uh, it's closed. So that's you know just signifying that the first piece was missing. So dh is equal to zero. Now I will moreover assume that it's non-degenerate. What I what I mean by that? It means that if I take it as a matrix, it's an anti-symmetric matrix, and it will have full matrix rank, meaning um, you know, it will have non-trivial eigen, no zero eigenvalues. And moreover, what I will also require is that there are no constant eigenvalues, that that all the eigenvalues will be sort of functionally independent. Um, okay, so that's my assumption. Let's take this one simple object, geometric object, and let's see what happens with, with this object. Okay, so first of all, uh, you can show, it's a two-line calculation, that if you have two closed conformal Klingeno tensors, and you take their wedge product, 
it will also be a closed conformal Klingena tensor. So in this in this sense, the uh, uh, conformal Klingena tensors, closed conformal Klingena tensors are super nice. Okay, what does it mean? Well, it means that I can take H, wedge H, H, wedge H, wedge H, wedge H, wedge H as many times as I want until I, you know, reach the uh, the full rank uh, in a given dimension, and then it, it will start being zero, of course. But if you know, I I can form of these things, and this will be again close conformal killing and tensors. So I can take J of them, and it will, be, it will denote H J. Very good. Next, I can take the Hodge tool. I told you that you know these close conformal killing and tensors and the Hodge tools. They transform to killing Yano tensors, the objects which I have introduced uh, at the beginning. So, so these these guys here will be killing Yano tensors. They will satisfy covariant derivative symmetrized over two indices is equal to zero. Also, I told you that if you have killing Yano tensors, you can square them, and if you square them, you get killing tensors. So, so this there's some stupid prefactor here, which was just to tune some numerical values or numbers. But what I'm doing is that I'm taking these Fs. They have in general many many uh, components, and I basically contract all of the components apart from two. Right. So, sorry. Um, so I leave A and B index here, and I contract all these indices here, and that will give me a rank two tensor, which will be symmetric by definition, and it will satisfy uh, the killing tensor equation. So basically what I'm telling you is that if you just start with one H, which is a two form, you can construct lots of these killing N tensors, lots of these close conformal killing N tensors, and lots of these killing tensors. Okay, that's beautiful about it. Moreover, that's not everything. You can take this Xi vector, which was already present in the definition of this H, which was divergence of H, right? You can show well, this actually, this is this is a little bit more difficult to show, but you can show that this guy has to be a killing vector. So the the existence of H also give you a killing vector. That's not everything. You can dot this killing vector with your killing tensors which you obtained. You get some other vectors. This is super simple to show once you know that xi is a killing vector that these guys will also be killing vectors. Okay. So what it means is that just one single object, you know, generates all these all these symmetries you can ever wish for. You have so many killing vectors, L0 and Lj, and you have so many killing tensors, and you have so many killing anotensors tensors if you want, just from a single object H. Okay? Moreover, because they are all um, generated from op one object, they have some very special algebraic, but also differential properties. Namely, what you can show is that, so, so there are some very useful brackets, which I don't know if I will have time to introduce. Basically, the first one is like a lead derivative of the killing tensor with respect to this killing vector here. This is a lead derivative of a vector with respect to another vector. Um, and this will be, uh, oh, anyway, so so there are these, you know, Shouten, Nijen, Hus brackets, and they are like quite important. And what you can show is that because everything is generated from one object, all these brackets will vanish, okay? And that's a very, very powerful statement. Basically, it means that um, if these, uh, if I consider the corresponding constants of motion, so so I have a killing tensor, I can make a constant of motion for geodesic, for example. I sandwich it with u and u. I have a constant of motion. Then I will have another constant of motion corresponding to another killing tensor. Then the vanishing of these brackets translates into the vanishing of the standard Poisson brackets of the corresponding constants of motion. So it means that your constants of motion will automatically be in, in evolution, for example. Okay, so now this is this is nice. So is it good for anything? Uh, and the, and the statement is yes, it is actually useful, very useful for black holes. Namely, you can show the following uniqueness theorem, uh, which was first shown by Ori, Ota, and Yasui in a uh, more special form, and then by us in a more general form is that the most general solution of vacuum, possibly with cosmological constant Einstein equations, that admits this object, this principal killing Yano tensor, is precisely the Carnot ADS spacetime of Chen, Lu, and Pope. In fact, you can actually use it, use this to derive the Carnot ADS spacetime. So if this spacetime wasn't known before, uh, you can directly go uh, to this spacetime by, by, you know, starting with, with saying, well, I have a 
arbitrary space-time, which admits this principle killing an tensor, what, it, what, what my space-time looks like? And the answer is, it has to be Kernel ADS space-time. Okay, so if, namely, if, if you don't care about lambda and don't care about not parameters, um, then your space-time is the myers space space-time, which I write over here. And you see that it, it sort of looks like care, but it's a little bit more complicated. First of all, you have more these rotation parameters. So you have up to, you know, basically dimension over two uh, parameters, rotation parameters AI. These mu I coordinates are basically like the angles, like cosine. So, so if you look at the constraint down there, so this is a generalization of the constraint cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta equals to one. So basically these mu and nu coordinates are some, something like theta angles. And then you have the standard phi angles, which are the, the angles in the two plane. So, uh, the, okay. So this is how the Myers Paris space time looks like. And, you know, it's more complicated than care, but not so much complicated than care. And it is, in some sense, the most, you know, general solution, which admits this principle killing an tensor if you restrict to vacuum. And if you don't want any pathologies on the axis, like not parameters. Um, this is how the principal tensor looks like in this case. So it's super simple. We know that it is closed, so dh is equal to zero. So h can be locally written as db of some potential b. And the b it looks super simple. It's just this thing here. Okay. So this is the metric, and that's the corresponding uh, principal tensor. Okay. So now we have shown that basically the principal tensor is important for black holes in any number of dimensions. In particular, in four dimensions, this will give you care metric. In higher dimensions, it gives you the Myers parametric or more general thing. So, so now uh, we have the space time, and you know the principle killing an tensor again it implies so many interesting properties of all these space times. So, for example, again you can show that uh, the integrability condition for that tensor gives you immediately that uh, the space-time has to be uh, algebraically special. It has to be of uh, of type D, okay? Type D property is related to the Kerr shield, and you can show that the eigenvectors of this uh, principal tensor are precisely the null vectors which which, which enter your um, Kerr shield form, for example. You can also, you know, separate uh, many of the equations, and I will talk about it very briefly uh, in what follows. Uh, you can you can characterize the separability of these equations by saying, well, typically in quantum mechanics, you know that uh, if you have a complete set of of commuting operators. Then you can, uh, you know, specify the eigenvectors to be your wave function or whatever, right? Characterized by the corresponding eigenvalues. So similarly, if you want to separate your equations, like at the classical level, let's say scalar field equation, uh, what you can do is that you can take your symmetries, uh, hidden symmetries plus explicit symmetries. You can construct the corresponding uh, operators. Uh, what will turn out that if you have the right number of these operators and they all mutually commute, then you can choose the common eigenfunction of these operators, and this will be precisely the separated solution. So basically, the Tarkovsky separated solution or whatever, let's say for electromagnetic perturbation, is just an eigenvector of all these commuting operators constructed out of hidden symmetries and explicit symmetries. Um, okay, you can do many other things. I mentioned the uniqueness. Basically, there's a uniqueness uh, into which le which leads to your black hole family of this principal tensor. Okay, let me elaborate on on two two aspects of this. So one of them is the complete integrability of geodesic motion. So here's the definition: what 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 it means that uh, something is completely integrable. Um, so. A motion in d-dimensional manifold is completely integrable if there exists d-functionally independent integrals of motion, which are in involution. And in involution means that they all mutually pass and commute one of another. And of course, this is a this is a notion of the Liouville integrability, so very nice piece of 19th century mathematics. But but uh, you know it's reviewed in, for example, these uh, articles here. All right. So what does it mean? So if I have a geodesic motion in d dimensions. I need to find d integrals of motion, post pass on brackets are all zero, and that are functionally independent. Okay. Well, I have some number of killing vectors which are generated from H. It's basically like 
well, okay, if you are in 2n plus epsilon, where epsilon is basically 0 or 1, depending if you are in, in even or, or dimensions, you can show that the number of the killing vectors which you generated is n plus epsilon. You have also the tower of killing tensors. You can show that there is n of them, okay, like this. And, and so these are the corresponding integrals of motion. And the question is, do they pass on commute? Um, uh, and are they functionally independent? So the Poisson point commutativity is precisely related to the to this thing here. So if these brackets are all zero, the corresponding constants of motion will all Poisson commute. Okay. So yes, they said they are, they are all in involution. The last thing you have to show is that they are functionally independent, and that has that was shown in this paper over here. So that's that's a little bit non-trivial to show that uh, these are really independent uh, integrals of motion. But yes, you can show that. And so immediately, the existence of H implies that your black hole space-time will have integrable GOT6. Um, questions? So now, now, I have a yes. question. So if, you know, if you have like the normal symmetries, some isometry group, then you expect solutions of the wave equation to transform in representations of that group. When you have something like this dynamical symmetry, is there a sense in which those solutions transform in representations of some other object? Or um, my first reaction would be no. I don't. I don't know if this has been actually studied, but but I would. I would first. My my first reaction would be probably no. Probably no. I I don't. I don't think so. But yeah, that's. I I haven't seen this discussed anywhere. So. Um, yeah, maybe it's an interesting research problem. Sorry to disappoint you. <laughs> More questions? Uh, yes, can I ask you one question? So far, you have discussed the case, for instance, of Kerr or Kerr, Kerr Tabnat in 4 and 5D, but there exist also more general matrix like the C matrix, which describes accelerating black holes. Like, does this reasoning carry through, or there are special cases? Or Because I think they're oh. more complicated, right? I mean, the. That's right. Um... Let me just state what, what I said, uh, but I didn't stress it. So, so you see, if you have these objects which 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 don't have the harmonic part, but but still have both parts, so they have exterior and divergence part, you will call the corresponding object conformal killing geno tensor. Mm -hmm. Okay. So certainly care metric will have this this conformal killing tensor because it has a better one. It has the killing geno tensor, the full mm -hmm. one. Right? So now what you can show is that if you rescale your space-time metric. Uh, by let's say omega square, you do, do the while transformation, right? Then, and you rescale your k times like omega cube, I think, times k, then this will be again conformal uh, killing geno tensor of the rescale metric. So, so that's why you call them conformal killing geno tensors because they have conformal symmetry in some sense. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so now what you can show is that if you, if you take care and then you, for example, go to Accelerated care described by the accelerated, you know, so by the symmetric rotating one or non rotating one, doesn't matter, right? By the symmetric, what you are really doing is that you are using some kind of conformal transformation. The two space times only differ by putting a conformal factor in front of that, in front of your metric, and by changing some metric functions, which are functions of radio coordinate anyway, which doesn't do anything. So, yes, you can show that the general symmetric. Or the general plebinsky demyansky solution, mm -hmm. if you want, in four dimensions, will have this object. It okay. will not have these two objects, uh, but mm -hmm. it will have this object. It's a little bit weaker than than these two objects, uh, but but in four dimensions, not so much weaker. Okay. okay? So yeah, yes, you basically what it means is, for example, you will not be able to separate massive uh, equations, but you will still be able to exactly. do massless equations. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so history of separatists. Uh, so when we wrote these papers, we called ourselves Alberta separatists uh, in Canada. But anyway, so so this is what is known about separability of various you know test field equations in in care and in higher dimensional care space time. So so here here I have the column for massless particles, and here I have the column for massive particles. Um, and of course, you know the first feast was by Carter in '68. Um, but uh, so, so who did actually integrability of geodesics, but also integrability of scale of wave equation, right? Then the Dirac equation was quite interesting because the massless one uh, was done quite early, but the massive one took another four years by Chandrasekhar and the, the uh, 
and his approach was completely different than the approach of Andrew and Tolkowski. Uh, okay. Um, and then you can go to vector and tensor perturbations if you want. You can go to higher dimensions. People were interested in this much later. So, so you can do for geodesic scalar, Dirac equation, massive and massless. So now a little bit uh, later on, um, it was shown by Lunin. <laughs> 2017 that yes you can actually do the electromagnetic perturbations and we extended this to the massive case and that interestingly applies to of course uh four dimensions as well so this was for the first time actually people could separate uh or uh, you know and uh, the massive vector field equation the Broca equation so now you see there are still some question marks uh so nobody knows as far as as, 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 as I know how to do for example the massive uh, uh tensor two uh spin two uh, perturbations and you know there are only partial results about separability of 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 tensor perturbations in higher dimensions so so this is still some work to be done i think it can still be done but but i'm not sure so now let me talk about this four dimensional interesting massive proca result and um i have probably like five now anyway, so so why this is interesting is of course you know the massive dark photons are interesting uh because they provide natural candidates for dark matter and you know in the simplest possible case you just describe the corresponding equation as the proca equation so you have really like um uh, electromagnetism but now with non-trivial mass right and 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 so, so possibly, you know, these these dark photons are, uh, you know, candidates for dark matter. So now, of course, you know, to detect these things is very difficult because they interact weakly. But if you have the right range of the masses for these particles, uh, you can detect them through black holes. And you know, that was done by Arvan Itaki in two thousand nine. So basically, what would happen is that if you have a highly spinning rotating black hole then uh then if you have the right branch of masses and of course there must be a typo here it must be 10 to minus 10 not 10 to 10 that would be that would be awesome but it's okay so if you have the right range of masses from 10 to minus 20 to 10 to minus 10 electron volts uh then this should be precisely sensitive to to your normal astrophysical black holes right and and in that case what will happen is that suddenly uh due to super radiance super radiant scattering you would start forming condensates um of these particles around the black holes and so the, your black hole would you know uh, uh spin down and what would happen is that now you have a non basically non-spinning black hole with some uh, uh clouds of these bosonic particles down there okay so that so that's the theory and then people could have done some you know analytic approximations and so on but nobody could separate this massive you know proca equations um, until basically Lunin came in, in 2017 with this paper and we came up with this uh, other paper in 2018. So so what you do is that you have this uh, Proca equation. Of course, as a consequence, if you take divergence of this equation, you have that this is a consequence. It's not, it's not a gauge. It's a consequence of your uh, massive vector equation. And then what turns out uh, and what, what Lunin didn't quite appreciate is that if you take the following ansatz for your vector potential A, where you take gradient of some function, which you will eventually separate, um, and you multiply this gradient by some, what we call some tensor, which we call like a polarization tensor, and you see what this polarization tensor is, is basically like an inverse of your principal killing arrow tensor. So, so there's a metric, there's an I, there's, there's some constant uh, of separation mu, and then your principal killing arrow tensor. So B is like an inverse of, of, of H, if you want. So this B uh, constructed out of this principal tensor enters your separab uh, separability ansatz. And, you know, if you take this, this thing, you separate Z uh, and you plug it into divergence of A equation, you will find second order equations of motion for Z um, and they will nicely separate and, and they will nicely decouple. Well, uh, you, you decouple, you have one degree of freedom here, so, so, so they will separate. Okay, but what is interesting is that once you have this ansatz and you plug it back to the full equation here, uh, that only gives you one small algebraic constraint, which is determined by this mass here. So basically, the separability of just this divergence of A equation uh, already gives you the full separability of the original equation. 
And the separability, is, again, is the standard one. You can write down without commuting a full set of uh, operators out, constructed out of the ki killing tensors and killing Yano tensors and so on. And the common eigenfunction will be this function Z. Okay, so anyway, so, so you know, this was for the first time this was separated. And of course, that saves some, some, some uh, numerical time. Otherwise, you have to solve PDEs, uh, this equation, PDE, uh, on your care background. Um, and so I, I wrote this with George Santos, who is a numerical guy, and he said, well, well they have a paper on this, and uh, they said, like, we, we, we have done the calculation, it took, like, months to, to do this, and they have, like, only a few points in, uh, in the diagram, uh, and then this is the separability ansatz, then he said, it, like, took, took him two hours, and then he has much more precise thing. Anyway, so we could only do two, two modes, and there's this interesting paper where they recover, recover all possible modes from our ansatz. So really, you have all possible spins you have s minus one zero or plus one this is the instability mode so you have you know whenever you have the imaginary part of your frequency uh, is positive you will have your black hole will be unstable to start forming these bosonic clouds and this is how it depends on on the rotation parameter uh a over here um okay so so you know yes you can use the separability and this killing tends are for something uh very interesting maybe to tell you something about the dark matter um, okay, I don't think I have. Do I have five more minutes or not really? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Yeah, plenty. Uh, are you sure? Okay. Um, so very good. So that's principal tensor. So now something much more recent, and uh, I would say also very interesting, is that um, here. Okay. So what are killing tensors? So we already know that they satisfy this equation. We know that we can we can uh, form the constants of motion for geodesics like this. We just sandwich k with the momenta, um, and this will commute with your Hamiltonian. So now, of course, what we are interested in typically is only irreducible tensors, meaning that you know uh, our high rank uh, killing tensor cannot be written as a product. Uh, of some lower rank tensors, right? So, so for example, you can take two killing vectors, you can symmetrize them, and that will give you killing tensor for free. But there is no new information in that killing tensor, so 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 that will be a reducible and no no new information. So now this is what I was advertising: is that if you take the corresponding constants of motion uh, and you, you write their Poisson bracket, this is how the Schouten Nijen whose bracket is defined. So basically, you take the standard Poisson bracket, uh, Poisson bracket um, and what is left is, you know, is homogeneous function in this piece. And what stands before is the definition of this SN bracket. Okay. So basically, if SN bracket vanishes, the, the corresponding constants of motion Poisson commute, which is what I was advertising before. But we also know, so this is how they how they look like ex explicitly. And you see that the number of indices doesn't match, that, that if you have, you know, rank P and rank Q uh, killing tensor, your your result is of rank P plus Q minus one. So so your result is is, is a higher rank in, in some sense, right? But what we know is that if you take a uh, Poisson bracket of two constants, you either produce zero or you pro produce another constant of motion. That's the, that comes from the Jacobi identity. Right. So, so, so basically, what you, what what can happen is that if for some reason this SN bracket does not vanish, it will produce a killing tensor of higher rank, right? Because the, the the resulting thing here has to be a constant of motion, and it is of this form. So, it has to be a this thing here has to be again a killing tensor. Okay. So, in principle, these SN brackets allow you to construct new higher rank killing tensors. So, why is this interesting? It goes back to one of the questions I asked. So people know lots of space times. I just uh, name here a few, which admits rank two killing tensors. But uh, people are desperately searching for other space time, which would have high rank killing tensors, right? Is, is there such space time? <laughs> Typically, you see papers where people ask this question, like, is there a rank four killing tensor in care space time? Right, and then they write down the equations of motion for this killing tensor, and then they write, write like formulas for five pages, and then they say, well, of course, we cannot solve this equation, so we don't know, right? Uh, so they are not known until recently. They were not known any uh, space time is high rank killing tensors, and I will give you an example of a space time which has these high rank killing tensors, and and it's surprisingly simple example. So this is the old lensing space-time long before care space-time. You have a slowly rotating object. 
Uh, so let's say uh, you have slowly rotating body and the field outside of that body is described by this. So you basically see that if I switch off A, I have I'm back to Schwarzschild. But if I have A, uh, non-trivial A, this is like a slowly, slowly rotating uh, care, right? So it is really a linear in A approximation uh, of care. Um, it is a vacuum solution to the linear order in A. Um, and already this solution gives you lots of interesting effects like it explains the gravity probe P experiment and so on, right? So now what, what Matt Visser has noticed recently is that if instead of this space time, you complete the square between T and phi, something miracles happen. So, you include, so if you look at this term here, you have D phi DT term, which is what you want to match here. But I don't put this f minus one, but I put some general function p. Okay, so then I match this term. Um, and then what I also include here is a square, p square, uh, dt square term. So I'm including a term of the order of a square. Okay, so that seems strange, but why not? And once you do that, you get space time. You can also include some arbitrary function n of radial coordinate here. But once you have the space time, this is a win-win situation from geometrical point of view. First of all, this thing here is only approximate care, so it will have only approximate uh, killing tensor symmetries and so on. However, this object has exact killing tensors. Okay. Moreover, this object here uh, is manifestly uh, regular on the horizon. If you take just the normal lens spacetime, space time, it will blow up at the horizon at the order of A square. Uh, the rich scalar will blow up and stuff like that. Well, the Riemann, Riemann square will blow up uh, on the horizon and so on. But this guy here is finite on the horizon. Okay. In fact, it, it uh, ad admits the species form, which I don't have time to uh, discuss, but it's super nice geometrically. You can go and play the same game in high dimensions. Okay. So you can include many rotation parameters. Um, again, you will have uh, species form and so on. But you can play the same game as you did, like we did with the principal cling innocent. This was the potential. If you include all the rotation parameters here, this will be the potential of care AD, of, of Myers Perry space time. Okay. So now I pretend, but now I don't include all the A's. I just include some of them. I choose which one, which which ones I want to include. I, I may include three, I may include zero, I may include whatever. I just choose that. I, I choose some particular set, which I consider. And then I treat it as a potential. I have a principal tensor. Once I have principal tensor, I have killing yellow tensor, exactly the same construction as before. And then I have killing tensor. Okay. This is how you generate exact killing tensors for this space time. Moreover, you can show that the number of these killing tensors does not grow linearly as for the Myers space space time. Well, it grows quite. Yes. The don't the same. Uh, say it again, please. I, I couldn't hear. Uh, I think they just had their mic on. I'll just. Oh, okay. Okay. So, so anyway, so 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 the number of these killing tenses grows quadratically. So suddenly you have. Uh, you know, rapidly growing tower of these hidden symmetries. In fact, it provides an example if, if, if for high enough D uh, number of dimensions, you can have a space time which is more hidden than explicit symmetries. Nobody knew that. But what is perhaps more is most interesting is that if you start taking these SN brackets of, of these tensors, well, most of them vanish, but some of them don't. And if they don't, they produce reducible high ranking tensors. And so, what, what seems to us is happening, but it cannot be happening, and this hasn't been really explored, is that suddenly you have a physical space-time, which is like a slowly rotating black hole, which has this you know infinite, well, huge tower of killing tensors, but they start producing high rank killing tensors. So now we really have space-time is rank 3, rank 4, rank 5 killing tensor, and so on. Okay, I am way over time, so here's the summary. Dynamical symmetries are genuine phase space symmetries that play an interesting role in many areas of physics. So they are not really only for general relativity, they are for integrable systems, for spins, for, for, for spinning tops or whatever, right? Um, and they are sort of like hidden in the configuration space. You only see them uh, in the phase space if you want. 
uh, in GR. Uh, these are described by killing and killing anal tensors. And, uh, and in particular, there is this very interesting example of the principal killing anal tensor, which plays really a key role for integrability of rotating black holes. Um, I also talk about these, you know, slowly rotating space times. Um, and they, if you complete the square there uh, in some real way, you get uh, space time which has so much, you know, so amazing geometrical properties. You have remarkable tower of rank two and high rank killing tensors. Um, and, you know, that, that's certainly some, some structure which nobody has seen before. Um, uh, what is not clear is that if you do this magic square, of course, you are moving from a vacuum solution to something which you now include a square term, right? So you are moving from vacuum solution to some solution with matter. It would be super nice uh, to find what kind of solution you have. And uh, we haven't done that. So let me finish with this slide. And please tell me any questions if you have. Okay, let's all thank David for a fantastic talk. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions. So just unmute yourself if you'd like to ask. So just so I understand, this large part of the talk, these are not, you don't view it as an actual approximation to Kerr that has all of these extra symmetries. It would require some dramatic matter content outside of the hole. Is that right? So, 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 so the object with the principal killing anal tensor, which is what was the first half of the talk. Yeah. So, so that that one is just the standard, you know, care in higher dimensions, possibly in four dimensions, doesn't matter, right? In any number of dimensions, this will be true. It's the standard vacuum case where you can possibly add lambda or possibly add not parameters if you believe in those. But, but yeah, it's the standard basically standard black holes, vacuum black holes. In the second part of the talk. So this thing here, this lens at space time, which was long before care, it's only an approximate vacuum solution to linear order in A. Okay. So now what I'm doing by, by completing the square between DT and D5 direction is I'm including an A square term, which shouldn't matter, right, in some sense. Um, and now what I'm doing is that I'm saying, well, with this A square term, in addition to this lens at space time, I take, well, I say, this is my exact space time, which is a solution of some Einstein equations with matter, right? Um, and that has remarkable geometric symmetries, but that's only like, if you want, it's a vacuum solution to the linear order in A, but it's an exact solution possibly to some, you know, maybe interesting matter to uh, to any order in, 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 in A, okay? So so yeah so so this so the second part was a little bit weird space time I I, I agree but it's just so geometrically nice that there must be something to it. <laughs> Does the matter that would be required in that case satisfy all the energy conditions that one would like? Uh, that's a good question. To be honest, we haven't looked into that. So yes, we should we should definitely look into that. Um, that's a, it's a good point. Uh, you said it still solves the Einstein's equation, right? The new well, metric. Well, if if I well, okay, look. So, um, sorry. So what I I'm doing some generalization here. So this thing here is a vacuum solution to linear order in A, where I take the metric function f to be one, the Schwarzschild one, one minus two m over r. Right, so this this is a vacuum solution to linear order in A. Now I'm a little bit generalizing it. I am saying this f minus one is now general function of p of r, and I'm also allowing a possibility that maybe there is some non-trivial, what is it, laps here, shift laps, well, one of those, uh, standing in, in in front of dt square. Right, so I'm a little bit generalizing this 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 space time. Of course, if I plug for p to be you know f minus one, where f is given by this, and plug n equal to one, this will still satisfy vacuum Einstein equations to the linear order in A because it only differs at the quadratic order in A, right? From from this one, but but because now I have the freedom to put any p here and any n, this is a more general class. And in fact, you can show that many of the space times, like with matter, like this is you know higher dimensional rotating black holes with uh, with charge 
okay, will fall into this category to the linear order in in uh, in a parameter and so on. You can you can put you can consider Kersen black hole. You can consider five uh, D black hole of minimal gauge supergravity and stuff like that. They will all fall into this class. In, you know, in the slow rotation approximation. So, so you have more general space time. Some of them have been studied with possible matter that that's, you know, uh, yeah, with some possible matter. Thank you. All right, well, if there are no more questions, let's thank David again. That was really great. And I'll go ahead and stop the recording. Thank you so much.